Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll begin today with an update from uh, Dr. Levine. Good morning, everyone. I'd like you to refer to my uh, little placard here, just to give you the beginning of the update. Each bar represents the cumulative number of cases on a given day during this past month. The blue portion of the bar represents the newest cases. Just eyeballing this, everyone can see that this does not represent linear growth. This is termed exponential growth. And we don't yet know what the days to come hold, but we can anticipate that everything will get higher. I want to remind you that it was only two weeks ago we had one case in Vermont. We have in excess of 100 now, 123 to be exact. The last day on this graph is the 23rd, but in my hand I have the most updated data which came after midnight last night, and there's now 123, and the blue portion is 28 new cases. The appearance of the graph is more important than the numbers. The other perspective is that it's only been about two weeks that we've been involved with coronavirus at this level in Vermont. And in that period of time, we've experienced now eight deaths. Six of the deaths are associated with the outbreak at the Burlington Rehabilitation Facility. And to be fair, these are every single one a tragedy in itself. Um, but most of the deaths there were in individuals who were uh, very medically complex, may have had advanced dementia, uh, and did not have uh, goals of care that were going to indicate they would be going to a hospital for full resuscitative efforts. But nonetheless, um, were it not for coronavirus, they would still be with us. Two of the deaths out of the eight uh, were not involved with that facility, but were still what we're finding are characteristic of the impact of this virus worldwide and nationwide affecting those who are older and who have other compromising conditions. So I'm very concerned about the slope of that curve and very concerned in our small state about the number of deaths we've had. If you begin to look at the experience uh, regarding deaths around the world, you'll find that in the countries that have been hardest hit, which would include Italy and Spain, the lines are pretty vertical in this direction. That indicates a rate of doubling of death every couple of days in those countries. There are now states in the United States that show the same trend. Our neighbor New York, New Jersey, most recently, Louisiana was added to that. Louisiana, two weeks ago, had its first case. It's seven times the size of Vermont population-wise, but it now has 1,000 uh, cases. And their death rate, as I mentioned, is accelerating uh, very rapidly with a doubling time over a few days. The state of Washington, which we've sort of used as our index case, if you will, uh, has a much more uh, diagonal slope. Still not wonderful, uh, but the death rate doubling there every week. So we in Vermont, I'm giving you this for perspective, want to make sure that we've caught this exponential growth in terms of the number of cases looking into the future at the right time and that we don't mirror some of those death rate curves where things are definitely getting uh, very rapid and uh, concerning. So this is why I view this as the perfect time for the governor's latest mitigation strategy and his uh, emergency order that will be talked about further in this conference. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about expectations, though, now that we are implementing the stay home, stay safe policy. What will happen, what we might expect. Many press conferences, we've given you this sort of 80% rule. And the 80% rule is still true, that 80% of those who get this virus are not going to be hospitalized, not going to be in ICU, certainly going to remain alive, and may have a mild to moderate illness that they can weather out at home, isolated. In the setting of a large-scale outbreak, as we're seeing in a number of other states and countries, you have to realize also, though, that not everyone is going to be immune in that 80% category. And there will be some people who are in the 20 to 40 or 50 age group who may get sick, much sicker than uh, we would have advertised, so to speak. And we're finding worldwide that some of the deaths fall in those categories, too. Uh, so I'm not saying this to be uh, scaring anybody, but at the same time, we have to be realistic that in large-scale outbreaks of disease, um, if you have 100,000 people that are sick, 20% uh, of them may be uh, younger that are hospitalized um, just because of the sheer numbers. But we still know that the likelihood of a very bad outcome in people who are younger is very, very low, but that the likelihood of the bad outcome as you get into 70s and 80s and above uh, becomes much, much, much higher. We know this is going to be a great hardship for people. We know this is unprecedented. But we also know this is really scientifically sound, but hard. And we know that um, Assessing the magnitude of the impact is challenging. This is a major lifestyle change for all of us to experience. But one thing we do know, and that's the magnitude of the impact if nothing is done. And I can assure you that the impact of what we're going to do will lead to a far more favorable end result than if we had done nothing at all. Everyone in the country is asking, how long do these things have to go on for? Is two weeks enough? Will we be open by Easter? Is three weeks enough? Should it be three months? I wish I had the very crystal clear answers for you, uh, but we don't have those answers, not as a national community or a global community, and we are learning all the time. We do know that we really do want to make sure that we suppress the virus to the point where not as many will be ill and not as many will be in the position of potentially overwhelming our health care system and its resources. And those are the goals that we have, not that we will prevent everyone from getting this virus ever in their lifetime. That's not how it will work. So although there are questions, we need to realize that we need to all be in, all in. It's helpful, as we see other states joining this effort, that we will have more of a regionally and maybe even nationally coherent uh, community kind of response to this, uh, which has worked well in other nations. We need to continue to learn from other countries and almost feel grateful for the fact that the United States came a little later in the game for coronavirus. And on a statewide basis, states are having activity at different levels. So as we go through this period of time that uh, we say stay home and stay safe, we will actually be able to benefit from studying our own statistics, as we will every day, but studying the statistics we find in the world where various strategies are being tried for various durations of time. It's become an expectation in the scientific community that we will flatten that curve, as we've talked about before, and then there will be a period of time where we hopefully will have suppressed the viral activity in the community, but that it may resurface again, whether that's Two months later, whether that's six months or a year later, it's really unclear.
but the population at that time will have much more immunity amongst itself. It'll be harder to pass the virus from one person to one person because many will have already been exposed and have some immunity. And we will be able to get on top of that with more traditional uh, case tracing and testing and isolation methods uh, much faster than the country did originally. And that will be a very good thing for us all. So in summary, this strategy is a wise one. It's scientifically sound. It has some elements of mystery to it in terms of not being able to tell you exactly what will happen on a given day and when. But it will work, and it will work best if we take and it takes a village mentality to this and work all together. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Levine. I know these are not easy times. There's a lot of economic uncertainty and much concern about the health of Vermonters due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I share the concern in both of these areas. But as we look at the challenges ahead, public safety must come first, which is why yesterday I issued the stay at home, stay safe order. Around the country and here in Vermont, we've seen an increasing number of cases which continues to grow. This is not unexpected. And while each and every step we've taken is needed, they have been difficult decisions to make. And this is a responsibility I do not take lightly. But here's what I need Vermonters to know, and this is what I need from them. I need you to stay home. Doing so will save lives. It's just that simple. That doesn't mean you can't go out for your essential needs or take your dog for a walk or take your cross-country skis out. Just keep your distance from others while doing so. We must all do our part to slow the spread of this deadly virus and protect the vulnerable, which includes the elderly and those with underlying chronic conditions. We must also do this to prevent the health care system from being overwhelmed which is important to the health and safety of all Vermonters. I fully recognize the emotional, financial, and economic impact this order will have. But based on the best science and the guidance of our health commissioner and the EPI team, each of the actions we've taken are absolutely necessary. And it's possible, as a forewarning, more may be needed. With the order I signed beginning at 5 p.m. today, Vermonters need to stay home as much as possible. We understand their basic needs. So you can leave for essential things like going to the grocery store or the pharmacy or to seek medical care, or as I said earlier, just to get out and get some fresh air or some exercise. But when doing so, it's important to keep about six feet from others. Wash your hands a lot and cough or sneeze into your elbow. And if you're unsure about something, whether you should be doing it or not, err on the side of public health and stay home. This order also directs businesses and nonprofits to suspend all in person business operations. To be clear, this is on top of the closures I've already directed and a requirement that anyone who can work from home should do so. These steps are important to slow the spread of this virus, but I understand there, there are also things Vermonters need in order to stay healthy and safe and to keep the state running. So we included some exemptions for businesses that are critical to public health and safety and to economic and national security, like healthcare options and, and operations and things like grocery stores and pharmacies, gas stations, hardware stores, critical manufacturing sectors, news media operations, those that serve vulnerable populations, as well as services needed to maintain critical infrastructure and transportation. These groups should be implementing the work from home policies I directed earlier this week, wherever possible, and making sure their social distancing constantly cleaning 
and employees are washing their hands, once again, a lot. Vermont small business owners have shown great creativity and flexibility. So if services can be offered online, or an employer can get products to customers with curbside pickup or delivery, where contact can be avoided, that can continue. Secretary Curley will talk about how businesses uh, can determine what's acceptable under this provision. Now, I understand there's a lot to absorb here, and there's going to be a lot of confusion, and there are going to be many different scenarios where businesses and employees are going to have a lot of questions. We'll work through these together. But everyone should be erring on the side of public health. We need people to keep their distance from each other, which is why this order is the strongest, one of the strongest in the nation. Just to put this into perspective for those that may think we're going too far, this virus is spreading quickly. It may not have affected you yet, but all too soon, many of us will know someone personally, and then it will start to feel very real. This is why we're asking our businesses to think beyond the next month. We all care about the health of our employees, family, and friends. The steps we're taking today are all about protecting our loved ones so we can come out of this as strong as possible. Today, we'll also be announcing that in coordination with Amtrak and partner states, Vermont will suspend all Amtrak service beginning tomorrow. More information will be coming out later today. Additionally, due to the recent snowstorm and the accumulation we received, and in consultation with VAST, they have agreed to close its trail network for the season beginning today. It's important to remember, if we follow the stay-at-home measures closely, we can get through this quicker and more safely and get on with our daily lives. And then we can get our economy moving again. Now, I have tremendous faith in Vermonters and our ability to follow this order to save lives and to support each other in this time of need. Now is a moment of service for all of us. It's our turn to face a once in a century challenge. But I know Vermonters are up for it because we're Vermont strong. We'll get through this, but we'll do it together. So I'll now turn it over to Lindsay Curley, our Secretary of Commerce and Community Development. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. I'd like to start by saying that we at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development fully recognize how hard the last few weeks have been on our businesses, employees, and all Vermonters. We hear you and we will continue to keep you informed with daily updates and guidance and provide answers to your questions. We'll continue that effort each and every day moving forward, knowing full well that the days and the weeks ahead will bring more pressure to the economic vitality of our business and people. I wanna stress the best thing we can do for our business community is to get through this crisis quickly and that can only happen if we are putting our health and the safety of Vermonters first. That means making some tough decisions and complying with this executive order as strictly as possible. These are difficult steps to take, but we believe these measures will slow the spread, flatten the curve, and save lives. And ultimately, it will allow Vermonters to get back to business faster. I want to clarify what this order means. The governor has directed all in-person business operations to suspend unless you are deemed essential to the COVID-19 response or national security. This means companies that can move all or part of their businesses to remote operations can continue to operate those parts of their business. Businesses that cannot transition functions to remote operations shall suspend those functions. Businesses can make their case to ACCD using an online form 
as to why their in-person functions should be considered essential to the response or national security. There has been some confusion about the word essential. The definition of essential is only pertinent if your business operations require in-person transactions. As for restaurants, this order does not change the directive the governor has already given. You may continue to provide takeout, curbside, and delivery. We know there are a lot of businesses out there looking for clarity. The ACC deem is working as I speak to address and develop guidance around those inbound questions. We will be responding to each and every single request that comes through our online form. Filling that form out is the best way to get in the queue. Please refrain from reaching out to individuals at the agency directly as it's important um, for the flow of our work to stay organized. The form can be found on the ACCD website, which is accd.vermont.gov. Our team will also be posting guidance today. This will help clarify many of the questions. But again, if there is more clarity needed or you want to make a business case for why your in-person business is essential, please go to our website and fill out that form. The form is called the Continuation of Operations um, form. We are also working to keep Vermont businesses informed of the latest developments as they happen, and we hope any business will first visit our website which is updated daily, and also sign up for our newsletter, which will put the information that you need into your inbox daily. Again, we know this is creating incredible challenges for business owners and the Vermonters who they employ, but we also recognize the public health crisis that we are facing, and we must take these measures to ensure that the Vermont economy emerges, emerges fr from this. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Welch, who will be giving an update on behalf of Vermont's congressional delegation. Congressman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Curley, and uh, thank you, Governor, uh, very much for your strong leadership. We have one mission, and that mission is to protect the public health and to restore the economy. Protect the public health and restore the economy. And the approach the governor outlined is that doing more now is far preferable to doing more later. The approach we have to take in order to save the economy is err on the side of doing too much too soon rather than doing too little too late. And to be successful, all of us have to be in this together, as Governor Scott said. Each of us as citizens to care for the people we love and the neighbors we value and respect have to keep our social distance, have to wash our hands, have to subscribe to the public health advice we're getting. Your state government works for you, for all of Vermonters. And your federal government works for you, all Vermonters. And we have to work in coordination in order to be successful in achieving those goals of protecting the public health and reviving the economy. Governor Scott has the responsibility of making the decisions about what are those steps to protect public health. His partners in Washington, Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and me, have the responsibility to work with the governor and Vermonters to take the economic steps that are going to help us get through this and get to the other side. There's really a division of labor, but there's a single, single mission. There have been three bills that have been, two bills that have been passed and one that is now being considered. The first bill, when this started, was $8.3 billion, and that was a big number back then and it was to get some money to our frontline providers, and it was to provide for some increased unemployment insurance, and that's been helpful. The second bill that we passed recently uh, was $100 billion for increased unemployment. It was also to assist our health care providers with Medicaid reimbursement, 
and supplemental nutrition for our kids who weren't going to school but are still getting their meals, and seniors who depend on these meals. Now the third bill is right now being negotiated with Senator Leahy taking a lead in the Senate and Senator Leahy's State Director John Tracy is here joining us. Thank you, uh, John, for being here. This is extraordinary. It is a $2 trillion economic aid package that is necessary. And there are many details to be worked out, but the contours give me some real optimism that Republicans and Democrats are gonna to come together to get that aid back to individuals, to small businesses, and to our states. And let me outline what the contours of that bill are that would make a big difference to us here in Vermont. One for individuals. We're gonna change the unemployment uh, uh, schedule. Right now, the top amount you can get in unemployment is a little over $500. Yeah, right, Governor? We would add $600 to that. That would be at no expense to the state and no uh, damage to the employer uh, for the additional claim. That would last for four months, at least. So individuals would be able to get up to 1100 bucks or more for four months because they have had to comply with the social distancing decision that is being made. Second, that unemployment is going to apply not just to folks who are getting a, a weekly paycheck, but to individuals who are self-employed based on their last year's income, and also independent contractors, you know, the Uber drivers, the folks in the gig economy. Our employment unemployment system has not helped them in the past. It has to help them this time. So that is something that there's a very good uh, likelihood we'll get that with the agreement between Republicans and Democrats. Next, small business. We know that in this state, many, many people, most of us work for small businesses. And those businesses are like family. And they want to keep folks on, but they have no revenue coming in. So there is going to be roughly $400 billion in emergency grants loans and loan forgiveness. It can be applied to rents and mortgages, utilities. Uh, it can provide a retention tax credit for employers who want to keep their employees on and pay 80% of what their wages had been. So the goal here is to help the small businesses through this time when the lights are off so that when the lights go back on, they're still in a position to get back to business and get folks back to work. The Hospitals is another component. Our hospitals have taken a huge revenue hit because they've had to stop elective surgeries. That is generally the difference between red ink and black ink for all of our hospitals that are vital to addressing this challenge, but also to the economic health and well-being of our citizens. There's a $100 billion fund. Most of us believe that should be a down payment because our hospitals are going to need more. And then finally, there's state aid. Uh, as the governor has explained, the revenue impact of Vermont and to other states as a result of responding to this is immense. And it hits on two sides, the revenue side, which is down, and the expense side, which is up. And we believe that it should be the responsibility of the federal government to be the one that bears the burden and not transfer it to the state or to the local taxpayer. So in the current legislation, where there appears to be significant progress in the Senate, and uh, again, thank you, Senator Leahy, for his leading role on the Appropriations Committee as its lead negotiator. We're focusing on small business. We're focusing on aid to the state of Vermont. We're focusing on aid to individuals. And we're focusing on aid to the hospitals. Uh, we're only beginning. But what we have to never stop doing is working together. The federal government has to be a partner, hand in hand with the state, and both of us, the state and federal government, have to be working for you, for individuals who ultimately are bearing the burden of the challenge that we face. 
I can speak, I know, for our congressional delegation. Bernie, Patrick, and I will be here. We'll be here for you, Governor Scott, and work together every single day in every way we can to help us get through this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman Welch. We, uh, we are very fortunate here in Vermont to have a strong congressional delegation that is working on the behalf of all Vermonters. Uh, I will say uh, Senator uh, Leahy had called me not, not long after 7 a.m. this morning when I was at the office, and uh, he had had a late night uh, going past 1 a.m., uh, but he wanted to call and let me know uh, that they had passed something or agreed on something so uh, to give us some comfort. So I appreciate that. Uh, with that, um, we'll open it up for questions. We'll move on to Sean Cunningham, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. On Monday, it was announced that the National Guard would be rolling out surge medical centers and that the first three of these are in the northern part of the state. Could you speak to uh, administration's plans for such facilities in the south, particularly how many, uh, what you're looking for in terms of facilities, and uh, when those would be expected to be online? Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'll have Commissioner Sherlin uh, respond to that one. Great question. Uh, we're working closely with the hospitals, hospital association to uh, deploy surge plans statewide. Uh, we don't have the specifics of the southern uh, surge plan at this point, but we're preparing multiple layers of surge capacity. So what you're seeing is the very first layer of a multi-layered strategy that will be deployed uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, as more information becomes available, we're, we'll certainly share that. Um, and, uh, you know, of note, um, the clinical uh, guidance that we get relative to what's needed in those sites is one of the most important things. So as this evolves and more information becomes available, uh, the physicians in the hospitals help to determine uh, where the sites go and uh, the types of sites that get deployed. Ann Wallace Allen from VT Digger. Star six to unmute and Ann. Ann, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, are there any penalties for businesses that uh, stay open that are not essential? Yeah, I, I, th I think we'll go back to uh, Commissioner Sherling. Um, Uh, as the governor's uh, indicated on a number of occasions, Vermonters are really coming together to uh, to heed the orders that have been uh, uh, issued to date. We expect the same will happen um, with this additional order that was issued yesterday. We're about to issue guidance to municipalities and, uh, and law enforcement organizations um, with suggested guidance on enforcement, and that really will take the form initially uh, of education and voluntary compliance. We really think this is a, largely a self-regulating event, but there are potential uh, for penalties if you violate a, an executive order. And there are additional things that could happen. For example, if a restaurant opened, there are health department implications and other licensing implications that could be at risk for putting the public health at risk. Um, but really, we do believe that education uh, and uh, voluntary compliance is the key uh, as Vermonters come together during this difficult time. I also want to, uh, I also want to say that uh, we've had a great response uh, from Vermonters on this. Uh, on the first round, um, many of the bars and restaurants and so forth uh, that had to uh, uh, to close, um, and it was difficult for them. Uh, but they really have used their creativity and imagi imagination, uh, and had done so willingly, understanding the mission that we're we're facing. All right, Keith Whitcomb of the Rutland Herald and Times Argus. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm wondering what, if anything, you can do to place, like, possibly a moratorium on, like, evictions. Because um, I'm thinking, you know, people are at home, they can't make money, but they still have bills to pay. Yeah. So I'm yeah. wondering if there's anything along those lines. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, we will, uh, you can expect something. Uh, over the next day or so, giving some guidance on that, uh, we're working amongst ourselves with a with the uh, legislative uh, uh, legislator uh, as well uh, in this uh, process. But we'll, um, we'll you can expect something in the next day or so on that issue. Okay, Colin Flanders, seven days. Uh, 
Um, thank you. So, uh, Governor, I have a question for you. Uh, could you just speak to what you're hearing come out of the White House specifically? I think as um, Dr. Levine alluded to, the we will be up and running by Easter. Um, can you just give us your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I, I can only tell you uh, from my standpoint, um, I think that is uh, a bit over optimistic, uh, to say the least. Uh, you know, this is going to take uh, weeks and months, uh, and this is going to be difficult. So um, we'll let the science and the data uh, drive our decision making, and we'll do what's appropriate for Vermont. Uh, but in my personal view, uh, this is going to take, uh, take longer than Easter uh, to overcome. All right, we'll take one from on site. Stuart? We noticed uh, there are quite a few police cars out and about now. I don't know if that's because regular workloads have changed, but will you stop people uh, to check on their activities when they travel or are out and about? Uh, you have seen an increase in uh, visibility of, of law enforcement. That's by design uh, during this time. Uh, the presence of someone out and about does not create uh, the lawful ability to create a stop, whether that's on a, in a motor vehicle or uh, a person walking, um, because there are legitimate reasons for people to be moving around. So that will also be part of the guidance we issue to municipalities and law enforcement organizations. All right, we're going to go Calvin in the room. Um, so, probably another question for Commissioner um, Sterling. So, um, what circumstances would uh, allow police to stop somebody if they were out and about? And also, uh, for the governor, what is the, uh, the penalty for, for breaking an executive order? Uh, relative to folks that are out and about, the, the, uh, the criminal overlay hasn't changed. So, we, the law enforcement officer would have to have reasonable grounds to believe that person committed a crime. Uh, being out and about does not create a direct nexus to a violation of, uh, of the executive order, so the two things don't directly connect. You'd have to have something else. Uh, in terms of the second part of the question, uh, we are still working under the, the model of encouragement and education. Um, we have seen uh, no abuse of that uh, thus far. Uh, we're going to continue uh, down that path until we find it necessary to do otherwise. But, uh, but again, encouragement, education, Vermonters will do the right thing uh, as, long, as long as they understand what the issue is, and that's why we've been trying to uh, to provide that uh, that uh, education ourselves as to the magnitude of the issue that we're facing. All right, Liam from VPR. Hey, Governor. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, you mentioned that you might be considering more stringent measures, and you also said this was one of the strongest stay-at-home orders in the nation. So I'm wondering what a stronger measure might look like, and what would the situation be that you would deem it necessary? Yeah, you know, when you uh, when you take a look at other countries, uh, some of their uh, measures have been uh, far more extreme. And I'm not contemplating, I don't want to uh, uh, put fear uh, into the general public, um, but, uh, but if we see the numbers continue to increase, uh, and then we're not bending that curve. Now, and remember, uh, bending the curve is not instantaneous. Uh, we're not going to see, uh, as a result of the actions we're taking today, we took last week, uh, bending the curve overnight. It's going to take a little bit of time uh, for that to happen. So uh, we'll watch the trends. Uh, we'll still continue to rely on uh, the best science we have avail available to us. Uh, from our from our epi team as well as uh, Dr. Levine, and then we'll continue to make changes as we see necessary. We are in hopes uh, that this will uh, have the effect that we uh, that uh, that we is going to be provided. Uh, but if it does not, uh, I just want to forewarn everyone uh, not to give any false hope, uh, because what we need to do is make sure that we're all doing what we can individually collectively uh, in order to bend this curve and to prevent our, our health care system from being overwhelmed. And so that's, uh, that's it. I mean, again, everything that I outlined in my initial remarks will be helpful. Um, but if we see uh, that there's, uh, there's no change or it's, it's getting worse, uh, then we have to take more measures. So we'll go back to Ann Galloway v, uh, from VT Digger.
Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, I wondered if you all could give us an update on hospital readiness. How many ventilators do we have, ICU beds, and how, are the, how is the PPE situation coming along with uh, any additional surge facilities that might be um, stood up in the next few days? Yeah, now I'll let uh, Dr. Levine uh, answer at this point, or, okay, man, I'm sorry, Secretary Smith. And this is uh, Mike Smith, just to give you some, as of today, bed, uh, hospital bed uh, cap uh, availability of 575 uh, total uh, beds, ventilators is 163. Mass in 95 mass are 78,000. Surgical mass are 88,000. I do want to say this: we have uh, 19 people uh, inpatient uh, with COVID-19 in our various hospitals across the state. We have 17 that are are, are waiting uh, and have our suspected of having uh, COVID-19, but are not, uh, have not um, uh, had that uh, patient, I, I, it, the, the term is patients under investigation uh, right now. And I want to be, uh, I want to talk about surge a little bit. This is not, these, these numbers I gave you are not enough. As we're looking at the surge here, uh, and looking at what we're looking, what Dr. Levine showed on his charts, I think at a minimum, we've got to double all the numbers I just gave you in terms of ventilators, b beds available, uh, those sort of things, as we sort of look at where these trend lines are going. So as we talk about surge capacity, and the Commissioner Shirley can talk about that in terms of set up, setting up these additional sites, we also have to look creatively and layer our planning for, for worst case, for better case, for best case, but we need to start planning for a minimum of doubling what, what I just told you. All right, Brittany. Wait, we're gonna oh. No, it's second, yeah. See if you can add anything. Sure. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the the surge site uh, build out is is happening, and uh, planning continues for that multi layer. Uh, in addition, we're sourcing uh, both ventilators and PPE. Important to note that the hospitals and healthcare facilities have their own supply chains. They're accelerating those supply chains as fast as possible. The state is helping to supplement those supply chains. We've bought millions of dollars in ventilators over the last few days. We have 202 that are inbound to Vermont. The timelines for delivery aren't known yet, but we're buying them as fast as possible. The same with PPE. Uh, as many as we can find, uh, we are buying. Folks have been asking, how many do we need? The answer is as many as we can get a hold of. So we're buying them as fast as possible. I'd also um, add, uh, in terms of the surge capacity, we did uh, hear a report of those three sites being set up by the National Guard. Uh, as a reminder, the site at UVM or in Burlington uh, is 150, uh, 50 at, uh, in Barrie and 50 in St. Albans. So there's uh, there's 250 right there. So with the other eight sites that we've identified, uh, we should be, we will meet the capacity uh, that we need. All right, Brittany from Local 22. Um, quick question for Dr. Levine. Um, have you heard of any cases in Vermont where people are saying they're losing their sense of taste, they're losing their sense of smell? And if so, does that mean this is evolving? Is coronavirus evolving to new symptoms? I'm really glad you asked me that so we can advertise what you just said um, because it's a very recent finding that it appears that one of the early symptoms before you even feel sick is lack of uh, a sense of smell. Um, this is so early that I can't say it's been confirmed by multiple investigators, but I think it's worthy of note. Uh, and people should think about it if that happens to them that perhaps it's an early sign of coronavirus. Uh, I've not heard anyone in Vermont who's mentioned that as their chief complaint, um, but I'm not aware of everyone who's had a chief complaint in Vermont, so they may have had that. All right, Michelle Monroe, St. Albans Messenger. <clears throat> Hi, 
Michelle star six. All right, Andrew McGregor, Caledonia record. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, you just mentioned uh, an identified need for, for wanting to double the number of beds, ventilators, and all the PPEs. Uh, is that based on uh, updated projections you're working from? And do those projections have top line numbers and, and the time frame about when you need that capacity by? We're working on projections that are updated daily based upon what we are seeing on a daily basis here. Uh, right now, we're looking at, at a minimum, as I said, a thousand beds, uh, at a minimum doubling everything that I had just told you. Uh, we'll update that on a daily basis as we move forward. And I think that is the best guidance we can give right at the moment. But as I said, there's a team that's working on this right now, and every day these numbers are updated. But I wanted to be as transparent as possible. This is not, the numbers I'm giving you are not the numbers that we're thinking are going to be the final numbers that we're going to need. Like I said, double them at a minimum. And for timeline, I think the governor said it well. This is not weeks. Um, this is. We're talking uh, uh, multiple months that we're talk going through this uh, this crisis. Uh, again, uh, I would uh, I would offer uh, that that part of our mission is to make sure that we don't have this surge and overwhelm the existing uh, facilities that we have today. Uh, if we can do this, it might string it out a little bit longer, but we'll prevent uh, the healthcare system from being overwhelmed, and that's our that's our goal. Uh, the County Courier, anybody on the line from the County Courier? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Governor, um, I'm wondering what, uh, what you saw take place in order to uh, change from a uh, basically a void contact order to a stay at home order. And uh, I'm also wondering when you guys expect the cases to peak in Vermont? Hmm. Um, I can answer part of that. Then I'm going to have Dr. Levine uh, speak to more, uh, more of that specifically. Um, but if you look at his chart, uh, some of what the information that they were uh, uh, keeping track of uh, led us to believe that we should take further action. And like I said all along, uh, based on the science uh, and the, the advice from our, from our experts, Dr. Levine and our EPI uh, team, uh, we came to the conclusion that this is the right time to do this to get ahead of it. So uh, that's why we made the decision that we did uh, in terms of when uh, we're going to crest, so to speak. Uh, it's very difficult to define. We don't know at this point. Uh, that's why we're taking the steps we're taking. Uh, and hopefully we can get ahead of this uh, so that uh, we can crest earlier rather than, uh, than later and, and not to the extent that uh, we've seen in other countries. But I'll ask uh, Dr. Levine to comment further. It again goes back to the frequently used analogy of knowing where the puck is going to be rather than where it is now and trying to anticipate that. And knowing what the exponential rates have been doing, this seems to be the appropriate time. Uh, it was great that we already had so many strategies in place. These are called mitigation intervention community strategies. Um, this is now the more culmination of those strategies. Uh, again, trying to do everything the governor just uh, commented on. We, you've heard a little from Secretary Smith about uh, the modeling that we have as well. And the only thing I want to say about that is now that we have exceeded 100 cases, um, and we have a much more, if you will, robust number of cases, uh, the ability of the modeling to be more predictive in a more precise fashion uh, is enhanced. So we will learn a lot from that as we go along. But most modeling, whether it's even in Vermont or another state at this time, is looking at a period of weeks for the peak, if you will. So whether that's two weeks, whether that's five weeks, or somewhere in between, that's where people are thinking that will occur. 
And uh, I think intervening at this time will certainly help us a lot. Chris Roy, star six. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, I've seen some people who have been tested positive for uh, COVID-19, COVID but they're still um, being released in the community. Um, why is that and what's to stop them from uh, going to partying everyday life instead of just going home? I think, I believe the question, uh, I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer this, uh, but uh, there are some who have tested positive and, and have been advised to, to stay home to treat this. Uh, not everyone needs to be in the hospital, and, uh, and I think Dr. Levine could answer uh, further on that. I think the question was, are there, if there are people out and about who have COVID-19 and are not self-isolating. Right. So, again, uh, to our credit, this is not a police state, so I'm not sure we know that information. We know that we have been in contact with anyone with a positive test and that they've been instructed appropriately. And even beyond that, their contacts have been instructed appropriately. So the hope would be that anyone who had been symptomatic, tested and knows they're positive, or had a high probability of being positive even if they weren't tested, but were told by their clinician that they had an illness compatible with this, have been doing the appropriate thing and staying, if you will, out of circulation. Um, we have to recognize that part of the success of the virus is its ability in some proportion, and maybe a small portion of the population, to be existing in a stage that it's contagious, but where the person has no symptoms and doesn't walk around knowing that they're ill. Uh, and that's how, indeed, a lot of community transmission, which we're seeing in Vermont, occurs. Uh, and just to further that, and uh, Dr. Levine can correct me if I'm, if I'm not stating this uh, correctly, but as soon as someone is tested, they're advised to isolate, to stay home, and not go out in the community. Um, so if we're seeing that, uh, we should know about it. But uh, at this point in time, um, we've seen that Vermonters are complying with that order. All right, last question, Lola from Digger. Star six? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Lola. Uh, great. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk about uh, child care for essential workers. Um, Guy, you point out to superintendents today uh, that makes it seem like uh, school districts providing this is now basically voluntary um, given yesterday's executive order. Um, is that correct? And if so, um, what's our capacity looking like uh, for providing this child care, uh, especially compared to demand? Uh, we have uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Boucher here, and she'll answer your question. Thank you. Yes, Lola, that is correct. That's some um, uh, additional guidance from the Secretary of Education just went out today. We anticipate uh, a number of schools have set up um, either themselves or via partnerships with private uh, child cares in their vicinity, uh, functional child care arrangements. We anticipate that those will continue um, as, they, as they can. Um, in other areas where they're still uh, struggling for a number of reasons to set up an in-school um, situation, we anticipate being able to help them uh, find uh, some private childcare spaces. I will say that uh, we have done a, a, a bit of a, a scan just with the superintendents, and it does look like every area that has a number, um, a large number of students um, who, school age students who need care, um, th they have found it, um, and the schools have actually been able to set up care that. Uh, meets that need. So there are a few areas in the state where um, luckily it's not a lot of um, children, but they're also um, looking at, again, building more robust partnerships um, because they um, are having difficulty uh, with school-based care. And I will also let Secretary Smith uh, speak from the child care side. Thank you. 
I think as we transform and as we move to a new era here, as the governor's uh, executive order puts us into stay home, stay safe, that we're also going to have to look and transform that uh, that child care sort of thought process as well. And so I think in the next few days, you'll see some further guidance on how we transform that system to make sure we're taking care of essential workers and uh, workers from essential businesses. So more to come on that, I think, as you uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, just really quickly, I know that you guys have been collecting, um, you know, through form requests for this care. Do you just have uh, numbers about the number of requests that have come in and the number of spots that are available so far? Yeah, I don't have that on me, um, I, I, and I don't, it's been quite a few, and at the same time, there have been a lot of matching that's been going on, but I don't have the precise number. I did on Monday, if you would ask that question on Monday, but I don't have that today with me. Okay, thank you. I, I do have school age numbers as of uh, Monday. They were approximately 360 with um, about 30 more uh, pre-K. All right, so that's uh, blocks or, or requests for care? Requests for care. In some districts as well, um, they're seeing a lot a uh, smaller number of parents take advantage of the slots so these were actually requests for care but it, again in a, in a lot of the um, situations a, a much smaller number of families and children are um, showing up to actually participate in the care all right all right. Well, that concludes the press conference. I'm going to thank everyone that uh, called in, uh, as well as uh, those who are viewing in, uh, for their understanding, their patience, and uh, taking every step necessary in order to provide, prevent this from spreading. So you can all do your part, uh, but we'll get through this together. Thank you again.